Hi guys, I'm Pete Robertson, front of house engineer for the Dropkick Murphys. Uh, tonight we are in Dortmund, Germany, uh, getting for ready for a big show with Dropkick Murphys, Frank Turner, and Jesse Ahern. So tonight's concert is at the Westfalen Halle. We have our friends from Go Audio providing our PA system for us today, which is made up of both KSL and GSL uh, for our main and side hangs. And we are using an array of Y7s along the uh, downstage edge for front fills. For audio consoles, uh, both myself and Monitor World uh, are big fans of the Avid S6L. Monitor World is using uh, the Avid S6L 32D. And at front of house, I have the S6L 24D. Starting, you know, when, when digital first started coming out, I was always a fan of the Avid consoles primarily because they could be found anywhere in the world. So I was always assured no matter where we were traveling on tour, I could find an Avid Profile or an Avid SC48 anywhere I went. What we do is uh, we have a gain sharing system with the Avid 6L stage rack. It's a uh, two fiber optic or two Cat5. In this case, I'm using Cat5 in a redundant ring and one stage rack. The monitor console has been selected as the master. So he has master control over the gain and I am the slave to that. And uh, for me out here, uh, the, the gain sharing has been transparent. I, we don't notice any differences in, in controlling gains or anything else. I choose not to get too fancy in my microphones. It's rock and roll, so you may not notice the subtle nuances of some finer microphones like putting Neumanns on stage, whatever, I think it might be lost. Uh, you know, so it's very uh, 57, 58, just very old school rock and roll package for us. I've been involved in some of their uh, studio projects. Um, it's, it's very helpful to know where their head is coming from, from the studio projects and translate that into the live show. But with Dropkicks, I mean, you get what you see. You know, they're, they're a bunch of great guys who just love, love playing rock and roll and punk, and that's the attitude and the approach they take during their live show. For me, uh, it's really just interpreting, you know, what their vision for this is in their live show and getting that to their fans. The fans want to hear it just how it is on the record. Um, I don't use any tricks. There's no voodoo in my plugins. There's nothing other than just, you know, keeping it nice and clean and precise, you know, and that's where it gets a little bit tough with so much instrumentation on stage. You know, and I'm sure there's probably little tricks with other plugins that I could be using to, to help along the way, but I, I take a very old school approach to it as well, and sometimes less is more. We have a fully comprised uh, Wave server uh, running a variety of Waves plugins. Um, I don't really rely on a lot of plugins for my mixing typically, but the few that I do use I find very handy. Dropkick just has so much stuff going on at all times uh, from banjos, mandolins, acoustic guitars, classical Greek bazooki, bagpipes, whistles, and then of course electrical guitars, bass and drums. So some of this helps me kind of clear the palette a little bit and hear things a bit more precisely and clean the mix up a little bit. So for the Waves plugins, uh, if I come to my plugin screen, it's actually very basic for me. It's mostly the API bundle that I use on things. Uh, API 2500 for drums, uh, a, a CLA 76 for the bass, and I use the API 550s as my guitar EQs. Um, and then for some light bus compression, I use something like the uh, uh, Avid's uh, stock uh, impact compressor. Uh, I use this on my vocal groups. Um, I have another group that I use. I, I mix very old school on my groups a lot. Um, so this just kind of helps tighten things up, kind of glues everything together a bit. The only people on in-ears is my bagpipe player and our singer Al. Uh, nobody else is very comfortable with the in-ears. It just doesn't give them the full feeling that they're used to for a rock and roll show. That being said, with everybody on traditional monitor wedges, it gets very loud on stage. I'm always watching my smart analyzer quite often during sound checks. I will turn the PA off and just listen to what I'm hearing coming from the stage and look at smart and having them help me carve some of the unwanted overtones or standing waves that I'm getting off stage. It's probably the hardest band I've ever mixed, both with their stage volumes and so many of the instruments that all live in the same frequency spectrum. 
Um, so a lot of it isn't about you know making one guitar louder than the other or uh, pushing a volume on a banjo to get it above everything else in the mix. A lot of it is all panning. You know where does each instrument sit in the mix? Treating the mix more as you know carving a jigsaw puzzle. You know every piece has its proper proper place in the mix. If you solo it, it may you may raise an eyebrow and say, well that doesn't really it's got a unique sound to it but in the mix it sits in the proper places and when you're mixing so many instruments it's the really only way to get them all to sit together. When we first started bringing in sound companies for our tours it was finding what worked best for this band in, uh, in different size venues. Uh, we've gone through several different sound companies. You know Go Audio has, has been remarkable with us here in Europe. They know the rooms throughout Europe. They know what we require for these venues and for the band. Uh, my system tech that's with me on most of the Dropkick shows with Go Audio has grown accustomed to my ear, so he, he knows exactly what I'm looking to hear out of the PA. By the time I come out and I'm ready to listen to the PA, nine times out of ten, he's already got it, got it dialed. I, I need to do very, very little with it. One thing in particular with the GSL KSL systems is uh, with their cardioid setup to them uh, and the array processing that they are able to virtually eliminate any noise from behind the speakers, uh, which has been somewhat unnerving to some bands. They get on stage and they don't hear the PA anymore. And I've been asked out in front of house during sound checks uh, if the PA is even on, uh, but you literally hear almost nothing on stage uh, the way that they've set the system up between the subarray um, and doing the array processing for the GSL and the KSLs, uh, it's pretty remarkable. You could, you could have the PA on at 105 dB at front of house, walk onto the stage, and it, it, you barely hear it. You'll hear reflections from the room, but you won't hear the boxes. Although I do run smart, I'm not looking at phase relationships between original signal and what's coming from the speakers. The system tech's you know, responsible for watching the phase of the system, the tuning of the room. He's the science and I get to do the artwork. So if I do hear something in my mix pop up, I can see a graphic representation of, of what frequency I just heard. I can monitor my, my volume all night. Uh, we do multi-track every show, every single night. So I have Pro Tools running every night. You know, it's a lot of inputs. I think we're at 48 inputs right now. So it's quite a bit for a, for a punk band. We found that in a venue the other day when they're aimed down a little bit, that it reflects directly off the front rows of the audience. Uh, and a lot of that will reflect back onto the stage. Um, with them aimed up a little bit higher, it, uh, it gets the sound out to the front rows and then just a little bit beyond. So it ties in nicely with the rest of the PA system. Uh, it just doesn't hit the front row and then stop. Their production manager, uh, Grizz Milton, and I toured together quite a bit uh, with, a bottom, with a lot of metal bands in the U.S. Um, so we, we'd already been friends for a long time. Uh, he came on as a guitar tech and worked his way up to production manager and had been asking me for years if I wanted to come and join these guys. But I had other bands that I worked with and had made commitments, so the timing didn't work out. And then uh, he just called me randomly and said, hey, we have a short little two-week summer tour you around you want to do it and my other band happened to be on uh, off doing a new record so yeah I got two weeks and two weeks became all right we're gonna do this next week and then we're gonna do these other four weeks and finally they made me a full-time offer and uh, I've been here for the summer will be seven years some of the nicest guys I've ever toured with you know the band is very respectful of their crew uh, there is no band bus crew bus, there is no band hotel, crew hotel. They want us all, it's just one big happy family, which is good, it's, you need that out here. You know, you, you give up your family to come out on the road, work out here, um, you need to have some sense of family and uh, you know, to be able to enjoy your life out here on the road, because it is hard. My name's Brian. I do lights for Dropkick Murphys. They're a lighting designer and lighting director. 
Most of the design uh, that I've worked on for Dropkick uh, is fairly simple. They've got a lot of people on stage, um, so I try and keep most of my fixtures upstage. Um, a couple of lines of, of different effects lighting, and uh, not too much on the floor downstage. Uh, one of the particular reasons for keeping it to some fairly simple straight trusses is because of our video wall. I don't want to block the video wall uh, with any of the lighting. Um, we're not trying to do any abstract design, and it's, it's really more about um, the musicians than anything else. You know, I'm just there to accentuate what's going on. You know, it's, it's not a spectacle like you, you, you find in you know, all the EDM stuff. It's like it's all about the lights. Well, it's, it's not. Here, it's, it's all about the guys. You know, it's guitars and accordions and banjos and a couple singers running around all over the place. I just, you know, I got my hands full trying to keep them lit. Uh, I don't really need a whole lot of uh, gimmicks or anything that's, that's crazy. Uh, for the most part, um, at least on this particular tour and most of the tours that we do in the States, uh, the venue sizes stay fairly consistent. Um, so uh, on most of the runs, or most of the, the shows on this European run, uh, we've got Go Audio providing um, our flown lighting rig. So there are a few shows um, where they've taken our lighting design and either they've had to swap a couple of fixtures around, um, but they try and get close to what we've designed. To, to make sure that no matter where we are, it's still you know the same basic show. Um, we've stuck with uh, primarily uh, Martin Quantum wash fixtures and Viper profiles uh, in the flown rig. Um, I've got some Auras that are down on the floor and some Roby uh, LED beam 150s uh, for ACL looks in the back, um, but they're just workhorse fixtures. I don't need a lot of effects or anything like that, so I don't use any of the beam shaping or anything in the, in the Quantums, um, and the Viper is just a workhorse fixture. Uh, they play a lot of songs. We've generally got 26 songs in the set, so um, trying to come up with a bunch of looks without repeating uh, is is easy with a Viper profile with the amount of gobos that it has in it. And uh, the floor set again is designed to just complement and not be too overbearing. So the primary lighting on the floor set is all in the back. There are four set carts. Uh, each set cart has a couple of Vipers on it. There's some LED beam 150s on the floor, a blinder, a JDC one strobe. Strobes are just for accents. The band doesn't really like strobes all that much. You know, it's not really an in-your-face kind of show is just little little punctuations, drum fills, that sort of thing. Everything is manual. There's no sequencing. There's no time code. Um, you know, there's no backing tracks or anything like that. Everything is, is run live. And there are some specific timing spots that uh, we've discussed with the band. Uh, and they do, they change the set list every night. Um, so depending on whether or not it's a song that I'm more familiar with, uh, it <laughs> depends on whether I can really hit those those spots that they like, um, but it, we do pretty well with it. It's not too bad. Um, I've generally set up uh, a, a very well. I don't want to say it's basic, but it it seems to be fairly basic bus page. Um, you know where I have uh, gobos and color selections on my touch wing, and then uh, I keep a lot of my uh, specials. Um, you know, key lighting and blinders and everything, all within hand's reach. Um, it's the same reason that I'm using a, you know, an old school uh, Pearl Expert Pro lighting console. I like having the, the faders and the tactile feel of the, of the buttons. Um, and it's, it's a rock and roll show, so we're using an old school rock and roll console. A lot of people think of Ava Lights as just, you know, an older you know, rock and roll type thing and, and that the technology isn't, isn't quite there, but with their newer Titan software, it's on par with any of the other consoles, your Grand MA or your Hog 4. Or I run a main and a backup console. They are linked here in a uh, Titan Net session, and it runs to the stage into an ArtNet converter, turns it back to DMX, and spits out our, I think we're running eight universes, six universes uh, in the flown rig and two universes on the floor. Our production manager runs the video. Uh, he's got a MacBook Pro um, on stage, uh, upstage left. He runs uh, all the content from there. 
And that's pretty much it. We've been running with a lot of the same content for the last few years. Um, and then every tour we change up, add a few more videos. Um, and he's gotten pretty good at, uh, at getting creative with some of the content so it, it doesn't end up getting too old and stale. I usually start with, you know, I'll listen to the song um, and I'll try and draw some inspiration from either uh, either the, the, like the album artwork or anything to try and uh, come up with a color scheme um, or just whatever. Uh, I, I always end up starting with the colors. So it's, it's whatever, um, whatever feels right for that particular song or if I can pick out a, a phrase or something that, that suggests some sort of color, I'll start with that. And then if it's a slower song, uh, you know, I'll add a, a gobo to it. Um, you know, a lot of those songs have, have less movement, but it's a fairly fast-paced show. Uh, and I've got two singers that make use of the entire stage, the entire barricade area. They run across the subs. Um, so most of my time, quite honestly, is spent just chasing the two of them trying to make sure that they're lit up. We have a couple of follow spots uh, that I don't, um, I don't call with a headset or anything. They're just, their instruction is, if the guys come off the stage, pick them up, and once they get back on the stage, shut off the spotlight. And it is a lot of work for them to deal with every night. My name is John Mark Antonio. I am monitors and stage manager for Dropkick Murphys. For monitors, I have uh, 12 mixes of M4s out there. Uh, I have uh, a stereo mix of Y7Ps for a little runway fill. Uh, I have a C7 drum fill up on uh, about three feet up in the air for a drummer on a three foot uh, drum riser and uh, six mixes of stereo in-ears. So there's a lot this, this little baby's doing right here. Uh, I used to be on the 24C, which was an awesome surface, but now I'm on the 32D, so I'm like, ah, oh, everything is there with metering and, you know, uh, a little screen where I can actually see what I'm doing visually because I am constantly changing stuff throughout the whole show. Uh, between the five positions down front, the second and fourth are constantly moving about four or five times a song. So I have snapshots that move their physical mix and the microphone in front of their uh, monitor over to the other one while the other one change. Between that also, I have a center pair that everybody kind of comes in and does their guitar solo or accordion solo and then leaves. I punch them up uh, and then I take them out. Uh, I also have the four upstage positions, which are kind of set for everybody, but anyone goes anywhere. So all of a sudden, someone wants to go up to that third upstage position, well, I'll just go either punch up their downstage mix or sometimes I'll just punch up what they're playing. If it's something quick and they're not like hanging out too long, they just want to do a little something something up top and then leave. There's uh, 28 channels of wireless currently right now on our stage. So everybody is on wireless. So if you're not paying attention, you know, like look and see what's going on over here, everyone's already moved. And I'm like, uh-oh, uh, 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 eh, sorry. So I have to keep my head in the game. That's why if you ever see me coming over, I'm always just kind of like bouncing around to the song, staying in the song. Cause as soon as you get out of it, you're lost. So when I first swapped over to the S6L, uh, we had some fly dates wherever and we weren't using our normal rig and I had some issues with wave servers. So I ended up replacing a lot of my waves plugins with stuff that was just on the console now. Like the dynamic EQ is fantastic. I'd take this, rivals a C6, you know, any day. Um, there's now EQ and compression on every output so I don't have to stack plugins, I don't have to insert a parametric or a compressor. 
Uh, you know, I have ones that are built in, so that eliminated my plug-in racks almost completely, and I've been just trying to get back to stock and just keeping it simple. Uh, we do a ton of fly dates, so we're not always on the same rigs all the time. Uh, we use a mix between Sennheiser and Shore Wireless. Uh, we're using Sennheiser EW300 G3s for in-ears. Uh, which work awesome. We have some older Sennheiser units um, doing a lot of the instruments, um, and then we have some new Sennheisers doing all of our backline. Uh, there's eight backline channels of just guitars and basses, and then we have another 12 uh, of all the instruments, like acoustic guitars, accordion, banjo, there's so many. Uh, and then we just are using the ULX 4Ds for vocal mics, we just switched over to those. Those are helpful. Ken, our lead singer, likes to throw them out into the audience and let people in the front row sing. So we're gonna go with the Axion systems, but every time I see that microphone drop, me, I look back at my production manager, Grizz, and we're just like, we made the right call. <laughs> because those things take a tumble constantly. And uh, you know what, they're durable as hell. Uh, knock on wood, we haven't had to replace one yet. We're pretty much all on JH-16s, Jerry Harvey Audio uh, JH-16s. These things sound great. They're not like the best JHs you can buy, but for the price point and for the type of music we have, it's just a big, loud rock show. It sounds awesome. I use the same in-ears as the artists do, so um, it's you know more of an accurate representation of what I'm putting out to everybody. Uh, if Al or Lee or someone was to switch, I would probably want to switch with them because, it, you know, that way it's more accurate to like what you're putting out, you know, to, to the guys on stage. 